Johnny Dollar. Johnny. Yes? Hello? Uh, George Reed, Floyd's of England. Well, what's the matter, George? You sound a bit down in the mouth. I am. What's up? Well, I... Uh, Johnny, I understand you've handled quite a few investigations for the Continental Insurance and Trust Company. Oh, brother, I sure have. And you know something, George? Yes? Floyd's of England, you, that is, have handed me some pretty wild ones over the years. I know. But believe me, they've been nothing compared to some of the cases that Continental has handed me. And you know why, George? Why, Johnny? Because of just one client of theirs. Well, uh... He's a wealthy old screwball by the name of Alvin Peabody Cartwright. Cartwright? Yeah, he carries a lot of insurance, millions of it. And any company that has his account is making plenty. Yes, I... But brother, I know. the fantastic problems that man comes up with. Why, it's enough to drive you off your rocker. I mean, I'm always the goat. Yeah, I handled one crazy investigation for him only three or four weeks ago. So I understand. They told Continental that if they sent somebody else around, he'd leave him flat. Uh, Johnny... Actually, I suppose I shouldn't complain. Some of the biggest fees I've ever got have come out of his pocket. And you know something? Yes, Johnny? In spite of all his wackiness and these silly problems he hands me... Well, over the years, I've really gotten to love the old character. And I mean, aside from those fancy fees I mentioned. Good, yeah, good. I, I think I'd do almost anything, within reason, that is, if it were necessary to help out Alvin Peabody Cartwright. Anything? Sure, anything. Oh, thank heaven for that. But now you said you have troubles, George. I have. So I'm sorry I chewed your ear off about something, someone, that Floyd's of England doesn't have to worry about, so... Don't we, Johnny? Huh? Well, of course not, because as long as he keeps his insurance with Continental, unless George. Unless what, Johnny? Well, I mean, if he were to change companies for some silly, some... Oh, now, wait. Yes? George. I'm still here. Just who is your problem? I'm afraid you've guessed it. Oh, no. Yes, Johnny. Alvin Peabody Cartwright. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Alvin's Alfred matter. The assignments George Reed usually handed to me were usually bad enough. But a combination of both George and Alvin Peabody Cartwright could be just a little too thick. Anyhow, expense account item one, a dollar for a cab to his office. Now, now look, George, don't tell me Cartwright has shifted all his insurance over here to Floyd's of England. Sit down, Johnny, please. Sure. Well... Yes, he has. And baby... As a matter of fact, after months of effort and expense, I managed to sell him on our company myself. Oh, brother. But if you have any idea of the amount of his annual premiums... Well, Johnny, it's a real feather in my cap. But don't you realize what you've got yourself in for? I'm afraid I'm beginning to. So, Johnny, if you can get him off my neck... Quite right. Twice in one month? Don't bank on it. But tell me all anyhow. It's really my own fault. So anxious to get his business... And if you know how much that man spends on premiums... Yeah, year, yeah, you said that. Now, get to the point. And I suppose I should have been more thorough, but... Well, we figured that Continental had known what it was doing, and we simply made a direct transfer of all his policies to this company, including the one that concerns us now. Only it should never have been issued. What kind of a policy? Straight life. On Carteret? No. With all the riders attached to it. Johnny, it not only covers her life, but accident, injury, mysterious disappearance, just about anything you can think of. Covers whom? Well? The name on the policy. Alfred. Alfred? Alfred Cartwright. A relative? No. No? But if his last name no, is... No, Johnny. According to this, this policy, Alfred is a ward of Alvin Peabody Cartwright. That's funny. I never knew that Cartwright had a... Well, what's the difference? What What's happened to this Alfred? According to Mr. Cartwright, it was an abduction. Oh, a kidnapping, huh? No, not exactly. 
Well, what do you mean? If he was abducted, that means he was... Now, wait a minute. Yes? A minute ago, you started talking about the insurance policy on her. That's right. And then you start talking about Alfred. Alfred is a she. Is a what? Hey, well, what do you mean about an abduction of her, him, uh, it, not being a kidnapping? Oh, I said not exactly. But Alfred was abducted. Yes. Oh, look, would you start making some sense about this? Well, I wish I could. And if this sort of thing is typical of car Come on, people... come on, George. If Alfred was abducted but wasn't kidnapped, well, okay, what happened? Well, you see, Johnny, Alfred... A female. A female. Well? Alfred happens to be a dog. Okay, so what's the difference? If she's been abducted, she's been... She's... A dog? Yes. Oh, no. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Alvin's Alfred Matter. George, life, accident, injury, mysterious disappearance, all that insurance on a dog? Yes, Johnny. A female dog? Yes. By the name of Alfred? Yes. A pet of that lovable old crackpot, Alvin Peabody Cartwright? His ward, Johnny. At least that's the way it reads on the policy, and that's why we thought nothing of it when the policy was transferred to us from Continental Insurance and Trust. Oh, brother. But why Continental ever wrote such a policy in the beginning? Oh, that part's easy, George. But the premium's only a drop in the bucket. I mean, compared to that on the rest of Cartwright's insurance. Now, listen. If they'd refused to write this complicated policy on his dog, they'd have lost all his business. Well, they have now to us. And, Georgie, you can lose it just as fast unless you try to do something about this this disappearance of that pooch. Unless you do something about it, Johnny. You've got to find Alfred and return him, her, return her to him. So will you drive on over to Lakewood and talk to Mr. Cartwright, see what you can do? So help me, George. And, Johnny, I promise, we'll not question a single item on your expense account, no matter what it is. Oh, As for a nice big extra fee, well, you name it. Well, will you do it? Okay, George, on one condition. Yes? That you keep this thing under your hat. I mean, after all, if the word ever got out that Johnny Dollar was chasing around the countryside looking for a dog napper... Johnny, I promise. I cross my heart and hope to die. What a business. With no limit on the expense account, I should have hired a Rolls, complete with livery chauffeur. But instead, item two was 420 for a tank full of gas for my own car. Within the hour, I was pounding on the front door of the Cartwright home over in Lakewood. Hi, Mr. Cartwright. No, no, no. I'm sorry, young man, but I'm far too upset to talk to anyone right now. Uh, so goodbye. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. Hey! Yes. Why, Johnny? That's right. Well, why didn't you say so? Come in, boy. Come in. Sure. Well, sir, how are you? Yes, come in and commiserate with me in my hour of bereavement. How anybody could be so wicked as to take Alfred, my pride and joy, away from me. But somebody did. And, Johnny, you must find her. I must bring the culprit to justice. Spare no effort, spare no expense, but come on, John. Well, have you any idea, Mr. Cartwright, who might have walked off with the pooch? That pooch? Oh, Johnny, how can you use such a term? Alfred was almost like a, like a child to me. Dear little thing. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, but you haven't answered my question. Do I know who committed this dastardly deed? Yes. Of course I do. Oh, sir. Come along, Johnny. I'll show you Alfred's picture so you know her when you see it. All right. But now, uh, why send for me, Mr. Cartwright? What? Well, I mean, if you know who did this. I certainly do. And, Johnny, he must be made to pay the penalty for this nefarious deed. Now, look. Here's dear little Alfred's room. Huh? Well, do you like it? Isn't it nice? I could hardly believe my eyes. It was more like the playroom for some much too wealthy child. Why, he must have spent thousands on it. On the soft, thick wall-to-wall carpeting, the, uh, well, all the furnishings, including a bed in the corner with a foam rubber mattress. 
Uh, there was a growing tree in the middle of the floor and a half dozen miniature fire plugs scattered about. There were rubber bones and balls and toys of all sorts and sizes that... Toys. In addition to everything a dog could possibly play with, there was a big table with a scale model electric train, an erector set, a microscope, a lot of other science toys, including a working model of a... Huh? Isn't it nice, Johnny? Oh, no, no, no. Look, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, yes? Don't tell me the dog played with these things. Uh. What thing? Well, uh, will this toy seismograph... Or... Toy? What are you talking about? That really works. <coughs> See? See how the recording needle gave a jump on the roll of tape on it? It runs for a week. Keeps perfect time. Oh, well, sure. So the dog could tell when there's been an earthquake somewhere, is that it? Well, no, no. It... I may as well admit, Johnny, that some of these things are mine. Yours? Yes, when I was a child, the only toys I had were the ones my poor mother could make with her own hands. And I always said that if I ever had the money, I'd make up for it. That I'd have all the things I couldn't have then. So, so maybe I'm just a silly old man, second childhood, that sort of thing. But I said I'd have them, and now I have. I see. Did you ever have a nice electric train when you were a youngster? Well, no, no. My uh, my folks couldn't afford it. Yeah, but, uh, I bet you wanted one, didn't you? Oh, sure I did. Doesn't every... Yes, and after you'd grown up, I bet you spent as much time looking at them in store windows as any kid. All the time wishing you dared to buy one. <laughs> just, a, just a habit. You think it's all a joke, Johnny? joke, Mr. Conrad. About the man who buys his son a train for Christmas and then, uh, well, you know, plays with it all Christmas morning. Yeah. Maybe you got a point there. Of course I have. And that's, that's the trouble with growing up. People get so proud or uh, stuffy or something that they, they won't unbend. They won't let their hair down and enjoy some of the simple little things that they'd really like to do. They're, they're, they're so afraid that somebody might laugh at them. I'm not laughing, Mr. Cartwright. And that's why I like you, Johnny, because you've sense enough to realize that, well, maybe an eccentric old character like me isn't so eccentric after all. He's just become smart enough to get rid of a lot of nonsensical inhibitions. Yeah, you have got a point there. Uh, maybe you can understand why this same old man is so... He's so upset about losing a wonderful companion. He's a dog. <laughs> she was such a dear. I, I looked all over before I found her and bought her and brought her here. Her, Mr. Carter. Yeah, that's right. Then why did you name her Alfred? Well, to be honest about it, Johnny, I'd really hoped for a boy. I have... Uh, yeah. Yes, now, you say you know who kidnapped, uh, uh, who dognapped her. Clarence. Clarence? Clarence Brixton. A stupid day server I fired yesterday. He was the only one that could have done it. Who would have done it? When did this happen? Last night, between seven and eight. I'd gone over to visit the widow Parkins. Oh, a bit of romance in your life, Mr. Cartwright? Oh, Johnny, how can you see it? Well, she is very nice. I mean, what I mean, whether that. Uh, there was nobody here but little Alfred. I'd even locked her in. Oh, what about the house? Was it locked? Of course it was. But Clarence still had his key to it. And if you know this house, Johnny, and nobody could have broken in. Oh, I'm sure of that. Besides, there was no sign of anybody trying to. There was no footprints outside. There was no ladder marks. There was nothing. Uh -huh. Even the stupid local yokel police agree that Clarence must have done it. Then why haven't they nabbed him? Because they believe his alibi. From that character, that wife of his... They live the other side of town, and she swears he was at home when it happened. And you're sure that only he had a key to this house? That's right, outside of my own. It's a... So he must have done it. Only the dumb police won't do anything because of his so-called alibi. Uh huh. And we got to break that alibi. That's right. But how? How, Johnny? Well, I had a crazy idea. Huh? Well, I thought I was the only one who got Just, crazy. uh, let me take a real close look at one of these toys in here. One of these toys? Yeah, that's right. It's a long chance, Mr. Cartwright. 
But let's see what happens. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I got back into my car and drove to the address of Clarence Brixton. I hoped he was as stupid as Cartwright seemed to think. Mr. Mrs. Brixton? That's right. I want to see your husband. Uh, no! No, who are you? Johnny Dollar, special investigator. No, get him out of here, Mabel. Throw him out. What are you so worried about, Brixton? First it was those dumb cops that crazy old geezer sends around here. Now it's you. Well, me, I'm for up to hear all this yakking about me taking that mangy little hound of his and that snapping, yipping little, little female. Did you cheat down to my Clarence? Them sharp teeth are hern. You show him your hand, Clarence. Yeah, forget it, Mabel, and shut up. You get these marks when you were hauling Alfred out of that playroom against her will? Huh? Now listen. A little dog, you said. Oh, not much bigger than Clarence's hand. Pies in his Oh, then you've seen it, Mrs. Brixton. Well, no. Now, Clarence told me about it. Yeah, sure, I told her. Ah, uh-huh, I see. Well, what do you see? And I hope it means the dog is still alive. After all, if you took the trouble to bring it here. Well, what are you talking about? You trying to say I stole the dog off of him? So maybe nobody did, wise guy. Now, what do you mean by that? Ask me, that lousy pooch got out of there on her own free will. Just to get away from that crazy cart ride like... Anybody in her right mind. Uh, out of a locked room and a locked house? Sure. Cartwright always left the window open so she could sleep good. He left so the dog took off somewhere. Uh-huh. A little dog jumped out of a third-story window? Why, it would have killed or crippled her. All right, so then he was wrong about when it happened. While he was out, he said. And he was out between 7 and 8 p.m. last night. And that's when somebody chased Alfred around until he caught her, then took her away. Prove it. Yeah, some big, clumsy ox like yourself, Clarence, who had a key, who knew the place, knew he'd better leave the place looking undisturbed before getting away. But he didn't. Yeah? Yeah. Take a look at this. What's that, huh? From a working model seismograph there in that playroom. What? You see, Clarence, every clumsy footstep of yours registered in black and white. For some five or six minutes during a period between seven and eight o'clock. Oh, it don't look like his feet to me. But I, I, I didn't touch that thing. You didn't need to. You, you mean them squiggles on the paper, my footsteps? What do you think? And what do you think of modern scientific investigation, Clarence? Scientifical, huh? Gee. But listen, mister, please, it was only so Clarence could make like he found the dog and then take him back and then maybe get his job back. Yeah, yeah, could have worked, too, only, only... Only what, Clarence? Some local cops. They was a pushover. But then you, you had to come along. All right, Dollar. Well? Dollar... I give myself up. Oh, sure. Modern scientific investigation. But he fell for it. And Mabel brought the dog up from the cellar. And she was kind of a mangy little pooch. Uh, The dog, I mean. But she meant the difference between keeping or losing Cartwright's insurance account. Which reminds me, you can forget the expense account. Cartwright did well by me, as usual. And he'll probably break down and take Clarence back. Oh, well. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's program. Well, first, a real hearty welcome to WATV in Birmingham, Alabama, and to KSOB in Cedar City, Utah. Glad to have you with us on the network. Next week, I run up the biggest, the fattest expense account you ever heard of. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny 
Funny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Howard McNear, and Frank Gerstle. 